This is back and forth. Oh, that's it. Okay. That's it. That's it. They will load the flight from there. How are you? Yeah. Nice to see you too. Hey. Hi, how are you? Good to see you too, Graham. Take care. Hi. All right. Usually the chairs sit here, right? We can just move this, the switch back. Yeah, just switch back. Let me do the I'll switch with Rob. There we go. Right. Yep. Hello, everyone. I don't know if you went down to the... Uh, Welcome to this uh, workshop. I'm Atta Qureshi and my co-chair is Karen Humphreys. Uh, today, uh, we discussed a lot about it, what's going to be. It, we thought we'll present you what we currently do in terms of quality indicators, what we have, what data we have, and how we are collecting the data. And uh, it will be mostly a brainstorming session, getting input from you. It's very difficult to get input through surveys. We thought it may be a good forum to get some input and see where, would, where, where do, uh, we go from here. So I'll let Karen uh, introduce our first speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and again, welcome. Uh, for those of you at the back, please feel free to uh, move forward. I think we can have a better discussion uh, at the end of this session if you do. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Laurie Lambert. Laurie is an epidemiologist, and she works in the cardiovascular sciences at INES. Laurie? Okay, so th this is sort of a little trip around the world in a few minutes. If that, that's not going forward, this isn't working. Can we move, move the slide? Hello. Are they aware? Sorry about this. Sorry about the technical glitch. Hopefully something will start working. Do they hear us at the back? I could talk a lot, but I think it's a lot more fun with pictures. Mm. <laughs> You're coming to save me? No? Oh, the computer crashed. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. We are on. Is that me? Yeah, that's you. That's your display. That's you. Okay. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to take one minute because we're talking about quality indicators to remember Jack too, who. Uh, I mean, there's no words to describe everything that he's done, and really everything we're doing here today is, is really because of Jack. And he uh, published this paper back in 2013 about the best practices for developing um, quality indicators. Um, so we miss Jack. So we're talking about STEMI quality indicators today. We're actually the PCI working group, um, and we have one uh, indicator at the moment concerning uh, STEMI, which is just to measure the delay from first medical contact uh, to first device. Um, so that's the only thing that we had included, and so I'm hoping to just do really a bit of brainstorming today to show you some other possibilities when it comes to STEMI. So the U.S., who um, has been very engaged in measuring the quality of STEMI care for a number of years, and put a massive amount of money into things. Um, so they have created this whole program called Mission Lifeline. And just to show you, so when we're talking about STEMI, we're not really talking about PCI, it's such a small part of it. So they have um, created um, toolkits and so on to talk about pre-hospital services, uh, what to do at initial contact, 
intrafacility transfer, chest pain, diversion, so should we bypass the closest center, should we go directly to a PCI center, air medical transfer, you know, talking about helicopters, airplanes, they're talking about indicators for the non-PCI hospital, the primary PCI hospital, tools for cardiogenic shock. As we were saying, it, it's a little bit depressing in a way, but it's just to at least see, you know, what, what we could aim for, and also roles for local government, state and federal government, and also payers, because that is all part of a STEMI system. These are some other measures that they've uh, added recently. So. Um, ECG within 10 minutes, um, door in, door out time, a uh, maximum of 45 minutes. Uh, the percent of patients for whom the cath lab was activated prior to EMS arrival and when there was pre-hospital notification. So if I think of Jack 2's paper, when I look at that indicator, is that really feasible to measure, right? There's a lot of ifs and buts and so on. So. These are things that we need to think about when we look at a quality indicator. That would be really nice to know, but can we actually measure it? Uh, ECGs within 10 minutes at the STEMI receiving center, the PCI center, did the patient stay in the emergency room for less than 30 minutes? And did the patient get uh, referred for cardiac rehab? So there is a quality indicator group for cardiac rehab. They have a quality indicator to see if the patient was referred, and so I think that was a, a good idea for us to at least be um, thinking about. This is just we in 2016 for the province of Quebec, so I work at Ines. We, um, we did a province-wide field evaluation, including 80 hospitals, and measured uh, also established quality indicators for the province of Quebec. These were really based on um, what the U.S. did, but we also set a target of 75% or more so same thing, proportion of patients with a delay of less than 10 minutes for ECG, proportion of patients with a delay of 30 minutes or less for uh, thrombolysis. Uh, 30 minutes, the US used to have their quality indicator as 30 minutes for door in, door out, and then what tends to happen is no one was achieving that, so we just changed the target to 45 minutes. So it was 30 minutes, we stuck with the 30 minutes. Uh, for transfers, first medical contact to device of 120 and 90 minutes for direct admission. And we also included the idea, a bit like the Mission Lifeline, you've got to have a committee that's trying to work to improve things. You have to meet your, your network of care needs to meet at least once a year and look at what your performance is in order to improve. So that was what we did, which was um, a lot of work. Uh, but really similar to the US. This is from the UK, so they've actually been measuring uh, quality of STEM care, so I've been doing this a long time now, since 2004, and so I've been following um, the UK uh, since then. So they have, it's worth looking on the internet, so that's available, an annual report, but you see what they've chosen to do is call to balloon. Okay, so they've actually got from the call and calling that really first medical contact with the system to balloon time, and uh, I thought it was interesting to make it, that was sort of a main feature of an increase of only nine minutes. Um, also, I thought it was interesting, so they're also looking at rehab. They've set a, uh, a target of 85% of showing how many people are being admitted for rehab, but again, you know, I think the theme is the idea, it's a system of care. Uh, some other things, yeah, that they also had, they didn't have the results for, but um, this is something, we had um, a summit for STEMI uh, for all of the province, and one complaint of referring centers was they want to be able to send their STEMI patient without having to call three different people without having to say, is it okay? It was one thing, you know, a lot of tension in the room. They wanna be able to make the decision and just send. And so that sort of to the same point I thought of this idea. A single point of contact, we're sending you a patient, uh, be ready. I don't know what you guys think of that, but something that uh, we've experienced. Going directly to the cath lab, not stopping in the emergency room. Um, another thing that could be an interesting quality indicator. And I think this idea of look at your results, but are you doing something afterwards? So 
you know, have you looked at what you can do, and sharing good performance, so identifying champions and seeing if you can learn uh, from them. I just wanted to show um, this one graph from our province-wide field evaluation of showing, because I, I feel like it's a little bit uh, passe, using uh, a French word, but to measure door to ECG within 10 minutes, because what this graph is showing is you see a median delay for patients who had, they already had a pre-hospital ECG, so we had very high rate of pre-hospital ECG, but 90% of people had another ECG done once they got to the hospital. So the median delay there was 52 minutes. So we see having an ambulance helps. Um, having an ambulance with an ECG helps, but then we're repeating it. If we don't repeat the ECG, um, but you're still in the emergency room, the door to device delay goes down to 33 minutes. And if we have a pre-hospital ECG, we don't repeat an ECG, and we go straight to the cath lab, door to device 24 minutes. So I just feel like this idea of the time um, in the ECG room, I mean in the emergency room in the hospital, I'm not sure that's what we should be aiming for in this day and age. Um, this is another area of thinking about of mortality. So this just got published September the 11th and um, because we're all interested in looking at quality of PCI, so this is this idea that what does it really mean if your PCI mortality is 2% or 3%? Because what that is, of the people you chose to treat, this is how many died. And if you look at the literature for public reporting in the states, the big problem was, well, if I do sicker people, they have more chance of dying. And so then my mortality rate is not going to look as good. And so they started having this problem of, of risk aversion, basically. So I don't want to treat my patients at highest risk because it's not going to be good for my public reporting. Um, and so we end up with actually not having better quality of care. And so this, on September 11th, is saying we should stop looking at mortality of PCI and we should be looking at mortality of coronary artery disease. So did the PCI center choose to treat the right people, um, to look at those who got a medical treatment, to look at those who maybe got lysis alone, um, those who ended up having bypass surgery, so having this, this broader view. And so we'll be looking a little bit later in the presentation about um, mortality of STEMI, but remember, it's of those who got treated. And I just wanted to show, we published this paper in 2016, um, so this idea of looking at all patients. So this, we published a paper on mortality of all STEMI patients, so whether they got a treatment or not. And really what we found was a, like a distance from a PCI center relationship. So the reference being a direct admission to a PCI center, and we see higher mortality transfer PCI was, a, they transferred 100% of their patients they were usually fairly close to a PCI center. Then we had mixed centers who could sometimes transfer and sometimes do lysis. They had a 58% increased risk of mortality, and we actually found for lysis alone, the results were actually you know, not significantly different because they tended to do the lysis quickly because they weren't deciding. They knew that was their single treatment they were going to do. So they did it more often and did it quickly compared to our mixed centers who, when they were trying to have a choice, actually often ended up not treating uh, at all. So we now have, a lot of work is put in, and we now have our own Canadian uh, STEMI guidelines published in 2019. And so the question is, where do we go from here? Because right now we have one, only one single indicator and hopefully I've just shown you all the things that we could potentially do. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Karen Humphreys from University of British Columbia. She's the Heart and Stroke Foundation uh, founding uh, professor for women's in uh, cardiovascular health. We have heard what is happening around the world, what is the potential. Uh, Karen is going to tell us what are the challenges that we face in STEMI care in Canada. <laughs> 
Thank you, Ada, and thank you for the invitation uh, to present to you today. I have no conflicts relevant to this presentation. So just to emphasize what Laurie has already told you, if you look at the PCI quality indicators that we have right now, the only one that really relates to STEMI is first medical contact to first device time, and that's for primary PCI. All the other ones here are just for PCI. So we undertook a survey and we mailed contacts in every province to try and get a feel for how many primary PCI centers are there, what are their volumes vis-a-vis -vis their population, and what are their volumes on an annual basis. And you can see that here. We have a couple of provinces that have just one center, Manitoba and the Atlantic Canada. And then, of course, Ontario and Quebec, with the largest populations in Canada, have the most number of primary PCI centers. We then also looked at how many primary PCI centers are there per 100,000 adult population, which we defined as 20 years of age and over. And you can see, again, quite a bit of variability there. Alberta, 0 0.91, uh, going to over 2 in Saskatchewan, uh, Quebec, and also Newfoundland. And then we asked the sites to give us their um, primary PCI procedures in a given year. Now we chose 2016, and these are their procedures. You'll notice there's Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, while they know how many PCIs they do, they were not able to tell us how many primary PCIs. We then tried to look at overall STEMI rates across Canada, and then how many patients with STEMI are actually getting a primary PCI. This, to, uh, this proved to be really, really challenging, just trying to get this data. So what we ended up doing, the blue line is the STEMI rate per 100,000 population. We actually had to rely on CHI-HI, the Canadian Institutes for Health Information, so the administrative data, to try and figure out what the STEMI rate per 100,000 is. So looking from west coast to east coast, you can see See the line from British Columbia to Quebec, fairly stable STEMI rates per 100,000, but something very odd going on in New Brunswick. I have a feeling that that data is just simply not reliable. And then the orange bars tell you the proportion of PCIs for the STEMI patients that presented uh, in those provinces. Again, I can assure you the Saskatchewan data is not correct. Um, that looks like it's almost 100% of the STEMI patients are getting primary PCI. While they were able to give us their PCI rate, they, again, could not tease out the primary PCI. So that number is clearly incorrect. And I have to say, I have my doubts about the New Brunswick one as well. So just to illustrate how challenging it is right now to try and get this fundamental data together for Canada. We also, as part of our survey, tried to determine for the primary PCI centers what proportion of their STEMI patients were actually arriving by ambulance. So you can see Ontario has the highest. This, again, is 2016, uh, well over 80%, uh, lower in uh, British Columbia and Alberta. Again, sadly, Saskatchewan and Manitoba unable to provide this information, and somewhat lower rates uh, in the rest of the country. And then given that you did arrive by ambulance with a STEMI at a primary PCI center, what proportion of patients actually got a pre-hospital ECG? Uh, again, you can see Alberta, Manitoba, and Ontario doing extremely well. It's 100%, other provinces lagging, and unfortunately, uh, Saskatchewan was unable to provide that data. This again is uh, CHI-HI data. When we can't find the data from our uh, sites and centers, we turn to CHI-HI, which I think is better than nothing. What we have here is actually the STEMI percent, so of the procedures done in your center. These centers are now the Canadian on the left, and then we're going from east to west as you move from left to right. What proportion of them uh, are STEMIs? And you can see a wide variability. It ranges from 3.4% all the way up to 38.1, with a national average of just under 29%. And then what is the STEMI mortality? Now, be careful, the STEMI mortality here is defined as death within 30 days after PCI. So to Lori's point, this is not all STEMIs. This is just STEMIs that underwent a PCI. Again, quite a bit of variability from 3 to 8.4%, and the national average just over 5%. So this is 30 days. And the time frame here is 2015-16 uh, fiscal year to 2017-2018. As part of our survey, too, we tried to look at what potential STEMI uh, quality indicators are people measuring. And you'll see that this list here very much mimics what Lori shared with us, uh, what the U.S. is trying to do. And then you have the provinces across the top. Where you see a tick mark, the province says, yes, I can actually measure this. 
Uh, where there's a question mark, they're measuring it, but they're not using quite the same standardized uh, definition. But I think what you'll see very quickly is for every province, there are a lot of dashes. They simply cannot collect that data. That's particularly true for Newfoundland and Saskatchewan. With the data that we could get our hands on, we took a track uh, a crack at trying to do first metal contact to first uh, device time. So we were able to do the median and the interquartile ranges for British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, and Nova Scotia. And you can see those values here. And we were able to stratify them whether you presented directly to the PCI center by ambulance or you presented to the PCI center because you walked in. So you see that there. Um, for Quebec, um, which I believe Lori would relied on chart review, it was also a different time frame. It was 2013. They did give us the overall, but were unable to break it down, similarly with Newfoundland. And then we also tried to look at if you were transferred from another hospital to the primary uh, PCI center, what did the times look like, whether you presented to that transfer hospital by ambulance or whether you walked in. Again, only BC and Alberta were able to give us me and times that we could convert to medians and interquartile ranges. With British Columbia, I would warn you that's actually based on three centers, not all five, so I don't know how reliable that is. And then some of the provinces, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and also Nova Scotia and Newfoundland could at least give us overall uh, median times. So um, I hope I've showed you that we have a couple of challenges that we hope to discuss with you today. First of all, at the moment, we only have one STEMI pr uh, uh, quality indicator, and it's really about primary PCI. Uh, most of the data that I've shared with you so far is very much procedure focused because that's where we have our data. Clearly, there's a lack of dedicated resources and funding to collect the data. I mean, some centers have to abstract the data from charts. Uh, as you notice, there's a lack of standardization of data definitions, and frankly, none of the sites were able to report on all of the indicators. So there are huge gaps here. The other thing that struck me as we looked at this data from our survey is the limited availability of pre-hospital ECG still, well, at least in 2016, and the lack of ECG transmission from that ambulance to the primary PCI center. And 24-7 primary PCI is not available everywhere, so it is not a level playing field. So I'd leave you with my thoughts here on what I think the next steps might be. Well, first of all, I do think we need way more STEMI primary PCI quality indicators than the current one that we have. And we have the recent CCS STEMI guidelines that I think could offer um, a lot of guidance. I feel personally very strongly provincial funding agencies absolutely need to step up and support data collection and reporting because without the data, we cannot move forward. And some provinces really have a lack of resources to allow them to do that. National reporting of whatever STEMI metrics we decide on really needs to happen on a regular basis. Remember I said we collected this data in 2016 and I'm standing here in front of you at the end of 2019. That simply isn't good enough. It needs to be faster and more consistent. And I'd also throw out one thing for your consideration. We tend to default to reporting by center. I understand that that does have some value, but I think we could think broader. Could we look at outcomes in the elderly? Could we look at outcomes in women? Because I think that also can support centers in terms of improving the quality of the care that they deliver, which after all is what quality indicators is all about. So thank you. Rob Welsh. Uh, he's from the Mazankowski in Edmonton. He's a professor there and an interventional cardiologist. Rob. So thank you. As I, as I reflect on the talks and move into mine, um, I've been asked to present on mortality, AMI, STEMI, and PCI from the CHI-HI data. I think when you reflect on the CHI-HI data, understanding it is one of our challenges, um, and I'm going to try to walk through some of that. But I think the other thing is understanding why we even have CHI-HI reporting, and then sec uh, secondly, the impact of public reporting. So the reason that PCI and bypass and bypass with valve surgery are presented are partially driven by us as a society, but also driven largely by our payers, because these were expensive procedures that they wanted to track outcomes by site. Um, we're entering an era now where we're getting more complex and we want to report on subpopulations, we want to 
report on disease states. Um, but we have to understand that the current data we're getting is somewhat limited and maybe somewhat um, selective. So uh, just briefly my disclosures. Um, when we think about the quality indicators and the quality care report, really the whole goal of this and its public reporting was to increase tra transparency related to the performance of cardiovascular health care systems and it's reported on a site basis across the country. Um, the data in theory now is more accessible to a broad variety of audiences including physicians to help them identify areas for improvement and obviously the end goal is to enhance the care of our patients across the country. Now many people in the room may not know that these CHI-HI data have been shared with administrators at your hospital for many years now and it's only really since the engagement of the CCS that we as a society, and I would say as a profession, have gotten fully involved. And we're now trying to understand and fully maximally use these indicators. And I hope you are using them at your own center to learn what you can do better and maybe share what you're doing the best. So when you understand the data, this is not chi high data. That's one of the things I hear. I don't believe the chi high data. It's actually your center's data. Your center collects data on a regular basis and submits it to CHI-HI. CHI-HI um, constructs it into a report format and gives it back to you. Where does this data come from? It comes from your discharge database, your national ambulatory care or NACRS, and your hospital mortality database. We'll touch on that in a second. The conditions and interventions are coded using a standard mechanism across the entire country in theory, Quebec being different and shown in, in brackets there, but the rest of the country in theory uses the same rules to apply the data. But obviously your administration that's in charge of the people that do the data abstraction, which are typically um, administrative assistants or trained uh, quality indicator people, um, really it depends on the rigor that they apply. So this isn't chi highs data, it's your center's data going to chi high and coming back. When we talk about mortality of post-PCI patients across the years, it's very stable in Canada. You can argue that it has upticked a little bit. And when we talk about chi high data, we're talking about in-hospital mortality. So that everyone's on the same page. What that means is if you died during a hospitalization, you were counted. If you had a sudden cardiac death at home and did not come to hospital, you would not be counted. So that's important to understand. This isn't census level uh, reporting, it's hospital level reporting. And if they don't make it to the hospital and get a formal admission, even in the emergency department, which would count, they have to at least make it there to get counted. When we look at the spectrum of outcomes of 30-day mortality, uh, in-hospital mortality after PCI, there are some striking things on this graph. So even though we have a unified system of care in Canada in theory, we don't all have the same outcomes. You can, th uh, my pop-up is gone, but, I, but I, had, um, I had some bars over top of some of these slides, but the basic point is that you can see the ones that are statistically below the uh, line that don't have um, the, the confidence intervals crossing the main bar, which is the median, and you can see some that are significantly above. So we as a, as a group of clinicians kind of barked at this and said, well, maybe we're not treating the same patients. So CCS and CHI have gotten together, and what they've tried to do is move forward, which you'll see on the next slides, by selecting out high-risk patients and telling us about them, and also selecting out STEMI. When we do talk about the adjusted mortality, which is um, what's applied and what's shown on the slide, the C stat for the adjusted mortality is very good. So a C stat of one would mean the model is perfect at predicting the outcome of interest, in this case 30 day mortality. A C stat of 0.5 would be it's a coin toss. Most of the things we do in medicine, if we can get above 0.7, we think we're doing pretty good. So this is approaching a 0.9 C stat, so quite a good level. And those are the variables that are in the model to um, report the adjusted outcomes. Now this next slide is impossible to read, but this is now looking at the percent of high-risk cases, 
the mortality if you leave the hot, all cases in and the crude mortality if you remove high-risk cases. Now, this is publicly available, so you can get this for your own site. But I did a little bit of reflection and tried to pull this out myself. High-risk cases, which are defined as presentation with shock or cardiac arrest, uh, range all the way from 1.5% to 6% of all reported PCIs. To try to look at the impact of this, I took the Canada average, the crude mortality, and then the um, mortality if you remove high-risk patients. And then you can argue it's somewhat arbitrary, and I've removed the site's names, but then I took centers with highest number of risk patients. So center A has 6% high risk, center B has 5.7, their crude mortality was 3.7 and 3 respectively, and there is some movement back to the mean, but maybe not the same for every site. And then I also looked at the other extreme, the centers that are reporting very low numbers of high-risk patients, their crude mortality. So if you look at center C, 1.5 high risk, center D, 1.5, the crude mortality being 2.6 and 0.7, and then their uh, crude mortality and remove these high-risk patients changing down to 1.8 or else 0.6. So some similarities in that you do move back to a more fair reporting but there's still differences between sites, and I think each of you should look through your own sites and try to understand your own level data. The other thing that was done on this slide, again, I accept completely impossible to read, and it's already been brought up, but when we talk about STEMI in this context, it is PCI and STEMI. It's not all STEMI, so you're getting a somewhat selected group of patients. But if you look across the range now reporting STEMI with crude mortality of STEMI cases with PCI, you get the same type of gradient where your STEMI mortality with PCI ranges from 3% to 84 Again, laid out a Canadian average showing a 5.2% crude mortality with STEMI and PCI. And then I took centers with the highest percentage and lowest percentage of <coughs> STEMI patients and showed their mortality. You can argue that the lowest uh, percentage-wise at least appears to have a higher mortality. This isn't science. I just chose some reflections of my own um, on the data. And then I also looked at the center with the lowest PCI STEMI mortality and the highest PCI STEMI mortality, ranging from 3% to 8.4. And they actually had somewhat similar percentage of patients presenting um, post-PCI with STEMI. So that's an attempt to bring together some of the data, make sure we understand what we're talking about with CHI-HI data, and then we'll pass it back to the next speaker. Thanks, Rob. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Akshay Bagai from St. Michael's uh, Hospital, Toronto. Akshay is going to talk about the physician's perspective of pan-Canadian results and mortality of PCI and STEMI. Thanks, Ada. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. So um, for this conversation, I'm going to provide the physician's perspective of, of the data that's already been presented, both uh, in regards to the STEMI data, but taking a step back and talking about the PCI indicators data that we've been uh, provided with from chi -Hi and CS CCS over the last three years. My disclosure is that I have been working on this chi -Hi CCS PCI quality indicators working group for the last four years. However, this conversation I'm approaching wearing my physician's hat. I'd like to start this off by providing a report card, a report card of the report that we have been receiving at our hospitals over the last four years. And again, this is my personal perspective, not meant to be a criticism of, the, of what we have available, but more meant to be a starting point for constructive discussion about where we are and where we need to go. I've broken it into three domains. The first is the dissemination of the data and the availability of the data to the physicians. And I've graded that as a fa fair to good, and I'll explain why I've done that. The second is engagement and participation of the physician community, the interventional community uh, in Canada. How engaged have they been in this process of the quality indicators? And I actually think that's fair and that's, I think, being generous. 
And finally, in regards to this data that's been provided to the physicians, what actions has this resulted in to change behavior at the hospital level and to make changes in your own practice or the practice of your region or your site? And I think there's a lot of room for improvement at the moment, and I'd show that there, anecdotally at least, there's been little action taken by physicians based on the data that we've been provided thus far. So physician knowledge is improving. The physicians are not, now much more aware that this data is publicly available, and that's been a step forward, recognizing all the limitations of this data as I will describe, but certainly it's an important point to start the conversation. There is certainly room for improvement in the physician understanding of how this data is gathered. And I think Rob has stressed that. This is not Kaihai data. This is our data. So physicians have to be engaged to provide the correct data and make sure that our hospitals and sites are providing the appropriate data to Kaihai so we get meaningful reports back. Physicians also need to be engaged in terms of understanding the quality of the data, the coding that's done, the limitations both of the data that's provided and then how to interpret the results that come back to us and also participate in the risk adjustment modeling because that's only as good as what data is collected and what is not collected you cannot adjust for. It starts off with seminars like this, like the workshop we're having today by publishing this data in peer-reviewed journals and also I think it should be a mandate of the administrators at each of your sites and of the cath lab directors to have this conversation with all the physicians that are involved in producing this data, specifically what we're talking about, the STEMI and the PCI data. We're a relatively small community. We've seen from the talks before that the US is way ahead of us and they're 10 times large in regards to the number of cath labs and the number of physicians. We're a relatively focused small community of 40-something cath labs and 250 interventional cardiologists. We have a scope of being much more coordinated and working together to engage in this process and to provide the data and to look at the data together. The physicians do need, I make a pledge here that, and, and, and ask from all the physicians to actually be engaged in the process, to, to provide input in terms of trying to standardize the data that's reported across centers, across provinces, and also work with the PCI quality working group to be on the calls uh, to provide input into what data that, you would be, that would be helpful for you to change your practice or Im to improve your practice. I think we are limited, as Rob has described, in terms of the quality of data we have. But I guess it's still data that we should look at at each of our sites or each of our regions together to regularly review it and to see the processes that would be best changed locally. And one of the things that we've heard about is the lack of funding. And again, we have to find our own local solutions to be able to find funding to improve the quality of data that's submitted and to provide quality, data quality audits. Thus far, even at our own center, anecdotally, little be behavior change has happened based on this data. Very little process changes that have occurred based on the data. And the two major reasons for that is this, I think people still, rightly so, don't have this full confidence in the quality of the data. And the data is limited in terms of what comes back, even from the data that we have, the reports are limited. Individual physician data would also be useful in addition to site, but also overall regional data because these hospitals are not working in silo. A PCI center works with non-PCI center, and actually having a data of the combined centers together for STEMI would be of, very, uh, of use. In addition to the mortality and the readmission admission data that's provided by CAIHI and CCS, I think it's more important and useful to get actionable data back things that could be used to make changes at your center, to, to see if we're make, choosing the right patients for our treatment, whether it's PCI or be performing PCI on a STEMI patient. The timeliness of reperfusion, whether we're using guideline-directed medical therapy in terms of the high-potency antiplatelets, statins, because those have effects in terms of outcomes of our STEMI patients. It's not just the PCI procedure. <clears throat> 
and also other adverse uh, uh, events such as stroke, bleeding, and contrast-induced nephropathy would be of use back to, pay, uh, to the physicians. So that's overall for the PCI quality indicators. Just taking a step now and give, providing some of my reflection on the STEMI data that we have that's been presented. So far, what we do have a good understanding of is the STEMI volumes across centers. And there's a large heterogeneity. I don't think that point has come across thus far in this uh, workshop, but there is a large heterogeneity in terms of the overall number of patients that undergo PCI. Um, for STEMI across centers, and also the total number of PCI at each center. We do have some understanding, with the exception of a couple of provinces that have been described, about the primary PCI rates for STEMI across centers. The use of pre-hospital ECGs we have data on, although not for all provinces, and we do have information on crude mortality for STEMI, not so much the readmission rates that was meant for the overall PCI. But what we don't have a good understanding of how to interpret the data that Rob has provided. He's already made the point that this is mortality that occurs in hospital alone, not for the sudden cardiac uh, death patient who has an arrest outside of hospital. Those patients are not included in this uh, report. The crude mortality ranges from 3% to 8%. That's a large variability. On first glance, it may seem that the 8.4% hospital is doing significantly bad compared to the 3% hospital. But this does not give you information of whether the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients are more or less likely to undergo PCI in the context of STEMI in one hospital versus the other. There are often are patients who are reaching the threshold of futility but some hospitals are much more likely to do that case compared to others. So we do need more granular information before we can actually interpret this data and s to make changes, particularly at the sites which may be considered outliers with a higher adverse uh, event rate. This has also been brought up that this is only PCI-treated patients who have a STEMI. Uh, we need to take a step back and actually look at STEMI as a disease process and the selection of such patients, because there are medically managed patients or patients who are lysed and not, uh, in, not undergo PCI, those patients are not included in these reports. There is variability across sites in the treatment of the high-risk patients. That's been brought up, and that needs to be taken into account when interpreting these absolute crude, crude mortality results. And again, these are patients who undergo PCI, but they come to the cath lab and undergo PCI through various forms. Some come to the emergency department, some come via EMS, and some are transferred in. And this whole heterogeneous population is included into one bucket. And that proportion of, or relative proportion of each of those categories differs across sites. Some sites are much more likely to, be, to include rural patients, and some are less likely to include rural patients. And therefore, the comparison of crude mortality is much limited. Now, risk-adjusted mortality is better than just looking at crude mortality, but it adjusts only for what is collected. The C statistic, as Rob has said, is very good, but it again is only for what is collected and the way the da data is coded across centers. We, we do not have information at present in terms of how standardized the coding is across centers, and I think this requires data coding uh, or data audits going forward. But this is a good starting point because at least we should be able to look at the outlier sites and provide them with some more granular data in terms of what processes they may be able to change or be able to work on to improve the heterogeneity or variability in the outcomes and make it uh, uh, more uniform across all centers. So those are some of my reflections on, this, on the data. Thanks. Thank you, Akshay. Uh, we move on. Um, so we have heard uh, what's happening around the world in the US, United Kingdom, other press other parts of Europe, what's happening at our local centers. What, uh, can we have the next presentation on, please? Thank you. So, I don't have any disclosures. 
And we have been reporting, um, our committee came up with eight quality indicators. We have been only able to report on three quality indicators, and we have been doing that for the last three years. And these are the quality indicators we are reporting on regularly with the help of Kai High. Uh, CC has started its initiative. This co committee was mandated uh, to come up with uh, certain measurable quality indicators. And uh, when we initially discussed those, these all eight were considered to be measurable, but reportable are only three, because there are several reasons for that. There's huge non-uniformity in data collection from across the centers in Canada. Appropriate documentation and availability of da data is a big challenge. And we don't have a national repository of data as such. The only repository we have is Kaiha, which is an administrative database. Uh, we all know that it's not a clinical database. It's an administrative database, and whatever comes out of it is what we have the best at this point in time. Can we do better? Probably. How? I don't know. Only STEMI quality related indicator that we have, which is the first medical contact to first device time, is not reportable. We may collect it at individual centers. We may report it individually, but we don't have a national system of reporting it regularly and see how we are, how can we improve. Yes, we can improve locally by looking at our own practices and see uh, our the STEMI guidelines were released, number of recommendations came out of that. How we are compliant to that, I don't think we have a clue, and would we have a clue? Three years of public reporting has happened, and I would just like to pose a question to the audience. Uh, has this public reporting of quality indicators, what we currently receive, has it changed your practice? Have you looked at the data by, uh, first of all, is everyone aware of uh, have you looked at your own center's data? Yes, no, maybe. So some of you have looked at the data. Others may not have. Has it changed your practice by, by any means? Probably not. So most recent report also included the crude STEMI mortality, and that's again available to everyone. It's uh, through the CCS website, through the Kaihai website, and if you want, one of us can email you those reports, just email it to us. It's available to everyone. It's publicly reported. Again, I'm not sure how many have actually seen this. Rob has presented some parts of it. It's the one page, and uh, Akshay has commented on that. And, uh, but again, it's purely mortality. It's in hospital mortality that we, have, we are looking at in, the ste in uh, STEMI patients who have undergone primary PCI. So the question comes, what should be done differently to have a greater impact in improving quality? I may say nothing. We already have a great system. Do you agree with that? Or have more meaningful quality indicator than mortality and readmission? It is easier said than done because we have limited resources in this regard. CCS proposed to the government regarding uh, extra funding for uh, this pro process, and we have been denied in the past. I'm not sure what happens in the future, but we have not been uh, assigned any uh, money to do proceed further to improve this process. What we would like to see is probably a wish list. We can discuss that today. Um, and as previously said, CCL STEMI guidelines came out with multiple recommendations, mostly related to process and system improvement, uh, put up very excellent, like this is the first guideline that has divided patients into three different areas where th based on their presentations, whether presenting to a PCI center, non-PCI center, or in the field. This is the only guideline that addresses all these areas and provided recommendations in each segment. And I'm proud to be the part of this process, but do we regularly measure and report? No, we don't have a central platform for reporting, and Kaiha is probably the only source at present. So it is administrative data. What could be done differently? Develop Kaiha, STEMI-related quality indicators, as I said, 
It's not the mandate of this particular committee, which is related, to, which is, was constructed basically to do, uh, to work on the PCI uh, related quality indicators. It's a uniform, create a uniform data set across all the cath labs. We discussed it among our group. It's easier said than done. It's not something, we are all interventionists and it's very challenging for us to agree on something. And uh, consider comparing smaller subsets, consider having different type of reporting, which I've listed. So I'll stop here, I'll open it for discussion. I'll, we need your suggestion where should, uh, what should be the next work of this committee for the PCI Quality Indicator Committee. And uh, we need your guidance in that. So I'll open it up for questions. Or any comments from the panel? Barry Ross from Newfoundland. Hi, Barry. Uh, just, you know, one of the things, if, if this becomes a publication, a comment and a question, and I do agree with a lot of what the uh, speakers have said, uh, data collection across Canada, physician inertia, uh, you know, just as an example, uh, in our own bypass surgery population, we cut our mortality for routine bypass in half just by revisiting the data and actually coding it properly. And that, that's partly physician, partly coder's fault. fault. Uh, I would ask, uh, I have a question for Rob and I'd make a comment as well, is one of the things is, for example, I hope that this is published, you say this is 2016 data because we've been doing primary PCI for some time, 24 seven. And in fact, that the data is available. So, I mean, I had a resident last year, an internal, second year internal medicine resident, look at our 2018 data, looking at the number of cases we did, which is completely different than what's presented here today. So the data is available. I don't know, you know, sometimes if we rely on, on certain databases. So just want to, uh, I would plead that maybe there be an asterisk, say, you know, this is 2016 data, which may not be totally accurate now. The comment is to question for Rob is, uh, <laughs> are we using the right mortality data? As an example, last year I did a primary PCI in somebody with metastatic cancer, and we questioned whether we should do that in the first place. But the, gentleman died of his lung cancer three weeks later, not a cardiac death. So are we measuring the right 30-day mortality, Rob? Um, or question to the committee. Should it be not cardiac mortality at 30 days? Well, I, I think um, the, the mortality data at least is a unified thing across the country. And obviously, you know, those one-offs of someone dying of renal cancer, lung cancer, sepsis, whatever, um, are thankfully reasonably rare within a month after an event and kind of balance out over time. And what Kaihai does is it doesn't take a year's data, it takes a summation of three years. I didn't stress that in the presentation, but you're actually getting a three years median de uh, death rate for your center. So it, it should balance out over time. Now it's never perfect using population health data, but it is the reality of the data that we can get at a, at a reasonable level. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that would be my uh, yeah. response, Barry. Okay, um, and actually I totally agree with you that uh, you know, this is there's definite physician inertia, and it became quite evident to us with the bypass surgery data that came out of our play, uh, that if we had to get our act together and basically start you know, recording There'd be people going home with a discharge summary, say routine bypass, but they forgot to mention they had severe COPD, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, you know, uh, wheelchair bound, all, all the all the other more all the various more morbidities. Yeah. And, and so, what, so in yeah. theory, that list of stuff Barry is covered by. I didn't go in details to the Charlson right. index, right? But it's actually pretty good at uh, dementia, cancer, renal failure, COPD. Other comorbidities, there's a list of about 25, I think, or right. 28 things that go in the Charleston Index, and it's been well validated and tested. So it's pretty good, but again, nope. um, it is what it is, right? Totally agree, but if, if, if people aren't recording it on the chart, and the people reviewing the charts, and that's the physician responsibility, uh, then you're, you're going to, you're going to uh, miss, miss it. I agree with the, the your comments, Rob, but it's just saying that physicians are suspect in recording that data sometimes. Thanks. Hi, Graham. Hi, Anna. Um, great job. I think this is uh, extremely timely, um, obviously very important. So a couple things. 
Um, to speak to Barry's point, um, I agree that the chi high data is potentially limited. Um, those definitions for stimuli-related mortality are 20 years old. Happily, and this is very topical, in about five minutes, Dennis Coe is leading a, a group that Warren and I are supposed to go to that to redefine the um, STEMI mortality, uh, how to how to measure it, and the mod and the variables to go into the model. For example, HIV and cancer were were not included in the previous um, model, and, and now we're considering whether or not to include those with a bunch of other covariates. <coughs> I would like to reiterate, I think the importance, I think Akshay said, about if you guys are gonna go and look at 30 to mortality, it's important, I think, to include all comers and not just PCI, which is what speaks to, to Karen and, and Lori said. We just presented our 11-year data from our region uh, a couple hours ago, and the mortality in our region for STEMI ranged anywhere from 3% in timely PCI to 44% if you had no reperfusion therapy for whatever reason. So, you know, if you want to get a sense of real world STEMI, not just limited to PCI, uh, to get a sense of how your system is doing and to get a sense of the range of types of patients who are getting STEMI, I think it's important to get everybody in. And that would include patients with cardiac arrest and patients who have cardiogenic shock, which in many large series are also excluded, so those skew the numbers as well. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, this is uh, very uh, relevant to uh, the times. Uh, I think that uh, I would propose that there be a standardized form that could be used nationally. Uh, there's different models that have been developed uh, across provinces, and Ontario, Warren and I had worked on one that has been used right now by the Core Health. I think you need something relatively simple and doesn't take too long to collect. I think it should be collected at the site by uh, coordinators that are familiar with what a STEMI is and not have a clerk simply, you know, see the STEMI word as a buzzword and then so you got a STEMI, but at the end of the day, the discharge summary really confirms that this was something else than a STEMI, it was a pulmonary embolism or a Takosubo or something else. So you need to have somebody that's properly trained. There needs to be a standardized, you know, standardization so that everybody's doing the same thing. So we're collecting all of the data on STEMI. I like the idea that we're looking at mortality. If it's mortality at 30 days or even in hospital mortality, the likelihood is that the mortality is related to the STEMI, that the patient's going to die because of his infarct. If you're looking at a year mortality, a lot of things can happen. But if it's within the hospitalization and it's close to the time that the patient has had a STEMI, the likelihood is it's connected to the STEMI. So I, I, I really think that we need to standardize across the province. We need to have coordinators that are trained. And we need also some auditing so that they go from hospital to hospital and make sure that everybody's collecting the data properly. And that has to be done on an annual basis because these collectors are going to change. They, you get a new person collecting the data. So in order to ensure that it is standardized and there has to be a report that's done, feedback, and there has to be some funding for this as well, as many of you have mentioned. You said the most important thing, the last, Michelle. <laughs> the funding is for this is extremely challenging and important because without funding to collect the data at across, it, it is collected at the PCI center, but the non-PCI centers in provinces which have single cat lab or a large referral area, it's a huge challenge to get accurate data from centers. And uh, you get data only patients who are transferred to you, not the patients who are not transferred to you. So can can I just me. interrupt for one second? So, um, you know, we have a, the PCI quality report. We're really talking about STEMI today. But the thing that people need to know is that Kai Hai actually has the national data by disease state and with appropriate resources could give us STEMI-based outcomes by admitting diagnosis of STEMI. And we've used this for research. I just pulled up uh, one of the health economics guys I worked with has four papers related to what we're talking about. Um, so it's not a lack of availability of data. It's the last point you made that um, even the data that we have, we can't pull out because the funding isn't there. And as you know, the CCS went to the government to try to get funding to expand the quality program and uh, failed at least this time around. So um, a call to action to maybe, um, you know, I guess the election's just passed. I'm not sure how long the minority will last, but, um, you know, next election for us to be a little more active at asking for what we need. 
Last question. Uh, thanks, uh, Katie Schufelt from Peterborough Regional. Um, so I. I think what I'm struggling with, again, with the 30-day mortality is not necessarily that it's not the right measure, because I agree with comments that have been made that that likely is related to the STEMI, but if we could get some more, you know, potentially make it broad and then get it granular, and I'm not sure who would be in charge of getting it granular, because if the patient dies, you know, three weeks later of, of you know, hospital-acquired pneumonia, where do we target our improvement measures maybe more in the ICU area of that care rather than did they get an ECG within five minutes? Um, on the other side of the presentation, you know, we often see our late presenters, you know, or people who, you know, were funny presenters or whatever. And again, I think getting some granularity behind that data will help us actually take what Akshay is saying from just kind of saying, oh, well, that was probably that person's problem or this, this procedural delay or whatever and, and actually find out whose area it is to improve upon. Um, I'm not sure if that would be something more appropriate at a local level or somehow that that can be provided by Kaihai. The only other point I wanted to make is we're focusing a lot on mortality, which is of course totally probably the most important marker, but perhaps again if we, I'm not sure if anyone's asked patients what they care about as a marker. Um, some may not say mortality as their number one, and it may be a quality of life indicator that we, I don't see anywhere on here, and that would be something I'd like to see. Go ahead. I, I, I seem to be the one talking all the time, but I, I think we can expect Kai Hai to, to spend the money to go down to that level. So um, I don't know about your center, but most centers do have a data group and you can actually get them to pull your own data by STEMI diagnosis and get a little more granular. They should be able to produce reports, and it takes a long time in most of these systems. Don't get me wrong. They're not that um, up to date, but it is possible. Um, yeah, it centralized reports from Kaiha is definitely possible. Kaiha can provide the granular data based on each center. You may have to pay a certain fee to Kaiha, or sometimes you may not have to. But Skyha can certainly help and provide granular data based on your center. It may not be able to provide data for all the centers, but for your center, it can definitely provide granular data. Just a quick comment, if I may. I'm really glad you mentioned quality of life. Well, we all claim to be doing patient-centered care, but we're measuring just mortality. Not that that isn't important, but the ability to measure quality of life would be an important addition. The problem is we don't have enough funding for the data that we have access to let alone the collection of and analysis of that, but a very good point. So with that, I thank you all, thank all of you, and thank you all to all my presenters, my colleagues. Thank you very much. <laughs>